Section 14 of Little Journeys to the Homes of English Authors. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jennifer Beckett Wood. Little Journeys to the Homes of English Authors by Albert Hubbard. Section 14. Joseph Addison, Part 2. The diplomatic language of the world was French. With intent to learn the language, Addison made his home with a modest French family, and a better way of acquiring the language than this has never been devised. A young friend of mine, however, recently returned from Europe, tells me that the ideal plan is to make love to a vivacious French girl who cannot speak English. Of the excellence of this plan I know nothing, it may be a mere barren ideality. A little over a year in France, and we are told that Addison spoke the language like a native, a glib expression, still able-bodied, that means little or much. From France, Addison followed down into Italy and spent a year there, residing in various small towns with the same object in view that took him to France. And one of his admirers relates that he learned to speak Italian perfectly, his pronunciation being marred only by a slight French accent. Addison's three years of foreign travel and the friendly society of the highest and best wherever he journeyed had caused him to blossom out into a most exceptional man. Nature had done much for him, but her best gift was the hospitable mind. Travel to many young men is the opportunity to indulge in a line of conduct not possible at home. But Addison, ripening slowly, appreciated the fact that the Puritan has a deal of truth on his side. There is a manly abstinence that is most becoming, and to moderate one's desires and partake of the good things of earth sparingly is the best way to garner their benefit. No doubt, too, Addison's modesty and tendency to shyness saved him from many a danger. Bashfulness is the tough husk in which genius ripens, says Emerson. Thus do we find our man at thirty, strong, manly, gifted, handsome, chivalrous, proud, yet tender, sympathetic, knowing, ready to serve his country in whatsoever capacity he could serve it best. When, lo, the death of the king cut off his pension, a new party came in, his influential friends were thrown out of power, and Addison's prospects wilted in a single night. The fact is that Addison from his thirtieth to his fortieth year was little better than a denizen of Grub Street. Fortunately, he was a bachelor, with no one but himself to support, else actual hardship might have entered. Several flattering offers to act as tutor or companion to rich men's sons came his way, and were declined in polite and gracious language. And once a suggestion that he wed a woman of wealth was tabled in a manner not quite so gracious. In passing, it is well to state that all of Addison's relations with women seemed to have occupied a lofty plane of chivalry. His respect for the good name of woman was profound, and whether any woman ever broke through that fine reserve and exquisite formality is a question. He was intensely admired by women, of course, but it was from the other side of the drawing-room. He kept gush at bay and never tempted to indiscretion. Addison's youth was past. He was creeping well into the thirties and still with no prospects. He was out of money, with no profession, and no special reputation as a writer. The popular poets of the time were Sedley, Rochester, Buckingham and Dorset. And you have never heard of them? Well, it only shows how a literary reputation is a shadow that fades in a night. Addison had written his Cato several years before, but no one had seen it. He carried the manuscript about with him, as Goethe did his Faust, for years, and added to it, or erased, all according to the moods that came to him. And we have reason to believe that the sublime soliloquy in Cato was written by Addison when the blankness of his prospects and the blackness of the future had forced the question of self-destruction upon him. Cato made a great mistake in committing suicide. 
He did the deed right on the eve of success. He should have waited. Addison waited. At this time, Lord Godolphin, who had the happiness to have a great racehorse named after him, occupied the chief place in the ministry. Marlborough had just fought the Battle of Blenheim, and it was Godolphin's wish to have the victory sung in adequate verse, for history's sake, and for the sake of the political party. But he could not think of a poet who was equal to the task, so in his dilemma he called in Lord Halifax, who had a reputation for knowing good things in a literary way. Lord Halifax was unfortunate in having his portrait transmitted by two poets who hated him thoroughly, each for the amply sufficient reason that he had failed to confer the favours that were much desired. Swift calls Halifax a would-be Mycenaeus, and Pope refers to him as penurious, mean, and chicken-hearted, satirising him in the well-known character of Buffo. Do not take the poets too seriously. All good men have had mud-balls thrown at them, sometimes bricks, and Halifax was not a bad man by any means. Let the poets make copy of their thwarted hopes. In reply to Lord Godolphin's inquiries, Halifax said he did indeed know the man who could celebrate the victory in verse, and in fact there was only one man in England who could do the task justice. He, however, refused to divulge his man's identity until a suitable reward for the poet was fixed upon. Godolphin finally thought of an office in the excise, worth £300 a year or more. Halifax then stipulated that the negotiations must be carried on directly between the government and the poet, otherwise the poet's pride would rebel. Godolphin agreed to shield Halifax from all mention in the matter, and the name and address of Joseph Addison were then taken down. Godolphin had never heard of Addison, but relying on Halifax, he sent Boyle, Chancellor of the Exchequer, to the address named where Addison was found over a haberdasher's, up three flights back. The account comes from Pope, who was the enemy of both Addison and Halifax, and can therefore be relied upon. The Chancellor of the Exchequer broached the subject, was gently repulsed, the case was argued, and being put on the plane of duty, the poet surrendered, and as a result we have Addison's poem, The Campaign. It was considered a great literary feat in its day, but like all things performed to order, comes tardy off. Only work done in love lives, but Addison slid into the excise office, taking it as legal tender. This brought him into relationship with Godolphin, who one day exclaimed, I thought that man Addison was nothing but a poet. I'm a rogue if he isn't really a great man. Lord Godolphin was needing a good man, a man of address, polish, tact, and education, and Addison was selected to fill the office of Under Secretary of State, the place for which he had fitted himself, and to which he had aspired eight years before. Moral. Be prepared. The party that called Addison was not the one to which he was supposed to be attached, but his merits were recognised, his help was needed, and so he was sent for. It was a great compliment. But good men are always needed. They were then, and the demand is greater now than ever before. The highest positions are hard to fill. Good men are scarce. Addison's knowledge, his modesty, his willingness, his caution, his grace of manner, fitted him exactly for the position and we have reason to believe that the salary of £1,000 a year was very acceptable to one in his situation. In another year the Whigs had grown stronger, Halifax was again a recognised power, and ere long we find Addison entering Parliament. So great was his popularity that he was elected from one district six times, representing Malmesbury until his death. It was stated by Congreve that Addison's habit of shyness was an affectation. If so, it was a good stroke, for nothing is so becoming in a man known to be versatile and strong as a half-embarrassment when in society. 
the Duke of Wellington's awkwardness in a drawing-room put all others at their ease. The eternal fitness of things demands that when greatness is in evidence, someone should be embarrassed, and if the celebrity is it, so much the better. Personally, I feel sure that Addison's shyness was not feigned, for on the one occasion he ever attempted to speak ex tempore in Parliament, he muffed the subject, forgot his theme, and sat down in confusion. With all his incisive thought and fine command of language, Addison could not think on his feet. And, as if aware of his limitations, in one of the spectator essays he said, with more or less truth, The fluent orator, ready to speak on any topic, is never profound, and when once his thought is cold, it will seldom repay examination. It was only a skyrocket. Without Addison's literary reputation, resting upon his essays published in The Tatler and The Spectator, it is very possible that we would now know about as much concerning him as we do about Sir John Hawkins. The Tatler and The Spectator allowed him to express his best, and in his own way. With the name of Addison is inseparably coupled that of Richard Steele, these men had a literary style which they held in partnership. The nearest approach to it in our time is the easy chair of George William Curtis. Curtis was once called by Lowell, with a goodly degree of justice, our modern Addison. Steele and Addison had been schoolmates at the Charter House and friends for a lifetime. They were of the same age within a year, Steele had been a soldier and an adventurer, and his disposition was decidedly convivial. He was a clever writer, knowing the world of politics and society, but he lacked the spiritual and artistic qualities which Addison's moderate and studious life had fostered. But on simple themes, where the argument did not rise above the commonplace, Addison and Steele wrote exactly alike, just as all writers on the sun used to write like Dana. Steele had filled the lowest office in the ministry, the office of gazetteer, the duties of the office being to issue a newspaper giving the official news of the day. It was a licensed monopoly, and all infringers were severely punished. Steele, however, did not like the office, because the powers demanded that all writing in the gazette be very innocent and very insipid. To publish a newspaper and say nothing is no easy task, said Steele. Had he lived in our day, he could have seen the trick performed on every hand. Finally, the office of gazetteer was abolished, and any man who wished might issue a gazette, provided he kept within proper bounds. The result was a flight of small leaflet periodicals, quite like the chapbook Renaissance of 1895 and 1896, when over 1,100 Brownie and Chipmunk magazines were started in America. Every man with two or three ideas and ten dollars capital started a magazine. Steele, teeming with thoughts demanding expression, at war with smug society, and possessing wit withal, started the Tatler, to be issued three times a week, price one penny. Seizing upon a creation of Swift's, Isaac Bickerstaff, a character already known to the public, was introduced as editor. Bickerstaff announced his assistance, and among others named as authority in foreign affairs, a waiter at St. James Coffee House known as Kidney. The spirit of rollicking freedom in the publication, with a touch of philosophy and a dash of culture, caught the public fancy at once. The Tatler was the theme in every coffee house and in the drawing rooms as well. Those who understood it laughed and passed it along to others who pretended they understood, and so it became the fad. Then the anonymity lent the charm of mystery. Who could it be who was into all the secrets and knew the world so thoroughly? Addison read every issue with surprise and amusement, but it was not until the fifth number that he located the author positively by reading an observation of his own that he had voiced to Steele some weeks before. 
Steele absorbed everything, digested it, and gave the good out as his own, innocent and probably unmindful of where he got it. This accounts for his wonderful versatility. He made others grub and used the net result. Some years ago, Francis Wilson made a mock complaint to the effect that whenever he met Eugene Field in the Saints and Sinners corner for a half-hour's chat, any good thing he might voice was duly printed next day in the Sharps and Flats column as Field's very own, and thus did the genial Eugene acquire his reputation as a genius, all of which gentle jibing contains more fact than fiction. When Addison saw his bright thoughts appearing in the Tatler, he went to Steele and said, Here, I'll write that out myself and save you the trouble. Steele welcomed him with open arms. The first Tatler article written by Addison relates to the distress of news writers at the prospect of peace. This is exactly in Steele's style, but we find ere long in the Tatler a spiritual quality that was not a part of Steele's nature. From current gossip and easy society commonplace, the tone is exalted, and this we know was the result of Addison's influence. Out of 271 articles in the Tatler, 188 were produced by Steele and 42 by Addison. Yet Steele was wise enough to perceive the superior quality of Addison's work, and this dictated the key in which the magazine was pitched. Yet the fertility of Steele surpassed that of Addison. Steele initiated the crusade against gambling, duelling and vice, and this was all very natural, for he simply inveighed against sins with which experience had made him familiar. His moral essays were all written in periods of repentance. His sharp tirades on duelling in one instance approached the point of personality, and on being criticised, he resented the interference and expressed a willingness to fight his man with pistols at ten paces. It must not be forgotten that Richard Steele was an Irishman. The political tone of the Tatler favoured the Marlborough administration, and on this account Steele was rewarded with a snug office under the wing of the state. In 1710, the Whig ministry fell, but Lord Harley knew the value of Steele as a writer, and so notified him that he would not be disturbed in possession of his stamp office. Now, a complete silence concerning things political in the Tatler was hardly possible and a change of front would be humiliating. And whether to give up the tattler or the office, that was the question. Addison was in the same box. The offices they held brought them in twice as much money as the little periodical, and either the patronage or the paper would have to go. They decided to abandon the tattler. But the habit of writing sticks to a man, and after two months, Steele and Addison began to feel the necessity of some outlet for their pent-up thoughts. They had each grown with their work and were aware of it. They would start a new paper and make it a daily, and they would keep clear of politics. So we find the Spectator duly launched with the intended purpose of forming a rational standard of conduct in morals, manners, art and literature. Every good thing has its prototype, and Addison in Italy had become familiar with the force of manners by Casa and the courtier by Castiglione. Then he knew the character of La Bruyere, and this gave the cue for the Spectator Club, with Sir Roger de Coverley, Sir Andrew Freeport, Will Honeycomb, Captain Sentry, and the Templar. Swift had contributed several papers to the Tatler, but he found the spectator too soft and feminine for his fancy. Probably Steele and Addison were afraid of the doughty Dean's style. There was too much vitriol in it for popularity, and they kept the Irish parson at a distance, as certain letters to Stella seemed to indicate. The spectator was a notable success from the start, and soon put Steele and Addison in comfortable financial shape. After the first year, the daily issue amounted to 14,000 copies. Addison introduced the Answers to Correspondence scheme. He has had many imitators along this line, 
some of whom yet endure, but they are not Addison's. An imitation of the spectator was started as a daily in New York in 1898. In one week it ran short on phosphorus and was obliged to quit. It took two years for Steele and Addison to write themselves out, and rather than let the quality of the periodical decline, they discontinued its publication, quitting like the wise men they were at the height of their success. When Addison's tragedy of Cato was produced in 1713, he occupied the first place in English letters. The play was a dazzling success, and it is a great play yet. It lives as literature among the best things men have ever done, a masterpiece. Addison still continued in the service of the state, and wrote more or less in a political way. The strain of carrying on the spectator and the stress of political affairs had tired the man. The spring had gone out of his intellect, and he began to talk of some quiet retreat in the country. In 1716, in his forty-fourth year, he married the Countess of Warwick, a widow of fifteen years standing. We have reason to believe that the worthy widow did the courting, and literally took our good man captive. He was depressed and worn, and longed for rest and gentle, sympathetic companionship. She promised all these, the buxom creature, and married him, taking him to her home at Holland House. Yes, it would be unjust to blame her. Doubtless, she wished to do for the man what was best, and so report has it that she exercised a discipline over his hours of work and recreation, and curtailed a little there, and issued orders here, until the poor patient rebelled, and fled to the coffee-houses. There he found the rollicking society that he so despised, and loved, for there was comradeship in it, and comradeship was what he prayed for. His wife did not comprehend that delicate spiritual quality of his heart, that craving for sympathy which came after he had given out so much, he wanted peace, quiet, and rest, but she wished to take him forth and exhibit him to the throng. Yet all of her admissions that he brace up were in vain. His work was done. He foresaw the end and grew impatient that it did not come. Placid, resigned, sane to the last hour, he passed away at Holland House, June seventeenth, seventeen hundred nineteen aged forty-seven. His body, lying in state, was viewed by more than ten thousand people, and then it was laid to rest in the Poet's Corner, Westminster Abbey. End of section 14